pollution control in general can be pretty intimidating. It's pretty complex. The, the regulations and, and what you have to meet when you throw it in as well with, you know, OSHA requirements, it can be pretty daunting. It's important to have somebody that actually understands those regulations, that they understand what's at stake, and that they're going to provide a product that really is going to do what they say it's going to do. We have exhaust fans, we have scrubber systems, we can provide people with consulting services, we can provide people with incineration systems, and we can provide people with combinations of all of that and then from a from a higher level we can thoughtfully integrate pieces and parts together to give people what they what they need by assessing their overall process. Ferrantis provides pollution control equipment for industrial applications for the most part in very uh, corrosive environments. Uh, most of our products are FRP which is fiberglass reinforced plastic and that's just a much better product to use when you have a corrosive airstream or a corrosive uh, type of application. What we do better than anyone else is basically we're able to take an application and start to finish off our complete package uh, for whatever the customer's needs are. We can uh, engineer, design, and replace an old existing system. Uh, there's times we also do retrofits. Uh, if they need one of our blowers in an existing system, we're able to design and engineer a retrofit for that as well. Problems happen in, in industry, so our, our ability to send field service techs out right away to either help them analyze what went wrong, um, we have those capabilities. We have the engineering in-house, uh, we have uh, technicians who have been working with our company for decades, um, so we're able to send you know very knowledgeable, uh, valued service techs out to the customer to help them with those uh, those opportunities. You can look visually look at our fans compared to other competitors and see the difference if you didn't know anything about a fan. I feel we're the best in the business. Some prefer the better things, uh, some prefer the cheaper stuff, but if you want to last longer, I think you should go this route through Verantis. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for YFRP presented by Verantis. I'm Mary Rusnak, Director of Marketing for Verantis, and today I have with me John Tonkowitz, our Senior VP of Technology, Sherry Liu, our fan, our fan Engineering Manager, and Junior Hardman, our Plant Foreman from our Manufacturing Facility. While we wait for just everybody else to continue joining us here, I'm going to go over a couple of uh, basic items here about the webinar platform and also about the PDH certification. As you can take a look at the webinar platform in front of you, uh, it's completely interactive. All of the windows can be minimized, maximized, resized, moved around. So basically do whatever works for your system. Uh, a recorded version of this webinar will be available later on, on demand, and basically all of the inter activity remains, so at any point in time you can come back and take a look and watch this over or print out materials. On the left bottom of your screen is the media player. If for any reason you lose sound, that would be the first place to look. Make sure that you don't have it muted or turned off somehow. Uh, for the Q&A on the left-hand side, that's where you would submit your questions. To keep ourselves on track, we are going to hold all of the questions until the end of the presentation. If for some reason we do not get to your question, don't worry about it. We will contact you later with an answer. Uh, on the left-hand side as well is the resource list. Uh, basically, it's available for viewing or printing at all time. You're going to notice uh, the YFRP guide. I just want to highlight that one because it's going to be a useful reference for any of you that are taking the PDH portion, the uh, quiz at the end. Uh, it's a nice little summary and can help you out there. You also will see that the slides for the presentation are available, and you can print those out later. Uh, there is some information about the uh, professional development hours that we offer, basically on a state-by-state -state basis. Uh, we are proud to be able to offer 32 states right now, so if you have questions about your individual state, please uh, take a look at that uh, PDF. There's a link to our Verantis EDU webpage. We have three more 
uh, PDH webinars happening this year. The next one is in June, and it's packed tower design. Pre-registration is available for all of these. So at any point in time, feel free to go on over and uh, register. And then just talk a little bit about the bottom are the, <clears throat> excuse me, the widgets. The first widget is our bio, so you can uh, get individual contact information on any of us there. Next one is the media player. Again, if you lose sound, that's where you want to take a look. Q&A widget, basically where you're going to submit your questions. Slides, if you lose your slides, you might have minimized your screen. You can click on that widget and it will open it back up. The question mark is the technical help section. So if you're having problems with the webinar, please click there and it will help you with some uh, different uh, troubleshooting. Next to that is the resource list, which is basically all of the PDF files that are available. There's a survey after that. That's the little uh, teal colored widget. Uh, we'd appreciate your feedback, so at any point in time, you're welcome to complete that survey. Next to that is the contact us. That will send an email directly to me. Feel free to, do, to uh, send me any questions or comments at any point in time. And if you'd like to share, please use the little widget next to that, that little paper airplane. Uh, you can share it social uh, during, uh, with the next widget, which is the little orange one. A link to our Brantis website is uh, the next one. And then finally, the last two are related specifically to the PDH portion. First one is um, basically you can track your progress. That's the yellow one. Uh, you must uh, have 50 minutes and complete the quiz, and this will actually show you uh, if, how far along you are with it. When you actually do complete all the requirements, you go back here to this widget and print your certificate. The final widget, green one, is the one where you will actually take your quiz. Uh, moving on, just a little bit of an overview of the PDH portion itself. Today's webinar is worth one professional development hour or contact hour. You must be present for at least 50 minutes, and this is both for our live or on-demand viewer. If you get interrupted or need to leave at any point in time, you can come back to the on-demand version and complete the requirements. You must also complete and pass the test at the end, which would be basically 8 out of 10 questions. Not all states require that you uh, complete a quiz, but we do uh, for you to actually re receive a certificate from us. Uh, you want to print your certificate when you meet all the requirements. Uh, that, again, is that yellow widget at the end. Uh, if you need to come back and print it later, you can just basically log in like you did today and you'll be able to get it. You need to keep a record log uh, of all the classes that you attend. Many of the uh, states offer uh, little spreadsheets that you can use, so feel free to go to your state's uh, website and figure out if they offer something in terms of tracking for you. We will actually keep records of your attendance and certificate for six years. If you have any questions that are related to this portion of it, feel free to contact me. Again, I'm Mary, and basically you can go to LinkedIn. You can reply to the email that you got earlier, or you can actually just hit the little button at the bottom, the widget. So, And moving on, we are going to move on to Sherry, who is going to start the presentation. Hello everyone. As an overview of this webinar, it will cover introduction to FRP Composites, starting with its definition, major advantages, history, and its fabrication. Then we will dive, dive deeper into how FRP is applied to industrial ventilation fans. There are multiple ways of abri uh, for abbreviation of FRP. You may see fiberglass reinforced plastics, or more generically, fiber reinforced plastics. Sometimes the letter P stands for polymers instead of plastics. The meanings are all similar with minor differences for coverage of materials or resin. For example, as technology evolves, carbon fiber started to be using some advan advanced applications instead of fiberglass well, it can still be covered as a type of FRP composite. Um, for presentation purpose, we'll limit the discussion to fiberglass, reinforced plastics, or polymers. The polymer matrix is a thermal set resin, most often being polyester, 
vinyl ester or epoxy resins. Um, it cannot be melted and then reshaped. We come up with this pool question, um, kind of have an idea of how many of you are related or somehow historically worked on FRP. So the pool question would be, have you ever been involved in specifying or purchasing a fan for a process application? We're going to give you about like 30 seconds to uh, put in the results. Okay, let's take a look and see what the answer is. Okay, most of you have actually uh, been involved in some type of uh, purchase or specifying for a corrosive application. Because of the unique characteristics, FRP composites offer many advantages compared to traditional materials. They are inherently corrosion resistant. They don't rust or corrode. There are various resin systems available which provide long-term resistance to a great range of chemical or tem uh, temperature environments. Properly designed FRP composite parts have long service, service life and a minimum maintenance requirement. Um, they last. Um, also, um, comparing to a lot of the competitive materials, it's low cost, lightweight, ease of molding complex shapes, and electrically insulation. There are cases of history for FRP fans being in service in like wastewater treatment plants for over 20, 30 years operating 24-7 only needed to replace bearings, metal shafts, or, dri or drives. The, compo the composites are very effective in providing high strength, of often stronger than steel or aluminum, in the lengthwise direction. As a mixture with fiberglass and resin, different ratio of fiber over <laughs> resin or a different type of material would modify the physical or chemical characteristics. For example, high fiberglass reinforced uh, structures pr produce a higher physical strength, or on the other hand, high resin content produce maximum chemical resistance. FRP composites don't have a really long history compared to other traditional materials. It was only invented in early 20th century and gradually become known and realized for, other, for, uh, for their potential. Um, it was rapidly developed in 1970s and the engineering community begins to focus on them in probably 1980s. Following the advances, uh, advances, uh, advances of the previous decades, FRP became accepted as a standard construction material by engineering or end, user, end, end users in 2000. It's why sometimes you'll read it as FRP being the material of the 21st century. As now we have a general idea of general background of FRP com composites, here we'll go we will go through some common FRP fabrication methods. Um, there are many methods used in corrosive applications, which are divided into two broad categories like open mode method or closed mode methods. Hand layout is an open mode method suitable for making a wide variety of composite po products including bolts, tanks, housings, and many other products ranging from very small to very large. Um, usually gel code will need to be firstly applied to the mold prior to laying up, laying up FRP materials. Then after the gel code is cured, su cured sufficiently, fiberglass is manually placed on the mold and then laminating resin is applied. Rollers are usually used 
to consolidate the laminates. Using this method, production volume is relatively low for each mold, but it's less expensive and best, best for minimizing air bubbles. Here are a few pictures of applying resin and fiberglass using a roller and hand laying up a sheet on a curved surface. Spray up or chopping. It is also an open mold method similar to hand layup in regard to a sealed bowl application. A chopped laminate has good conformability and is sometimes faster than hand layup. Similarly, gel coat needs to be applied first, then continuous strand glass roving um, is going to be fed through a chopper gun, then deposits on the surface. The laminate is then rolled to you know, thoroughly saturate the glass strands and then compact the chop. Both male mold and female mold can be used. Um, as contact surfaces, over mold is relatively smooth, smoother uh, comparing to the other side. Consideration should be taken to make sure mold surfaces are used for the side where a part is requiring a higher surface quality. As example, for building up FRP duct or FRP fan housings, a male mode usually would give a smoother surface for interior surface, which is going to be better for airflow. Also, male modes are cheaper to make comparing to female modes. This is a picture to show how a duct color is made by chopping. Compression mold is a high volume, high pressure method suitable for molding FRP parts on a rapid cycle time. The mold typically is set you know, on a mounted hydraulic or mechanical molding press. Um, the mold can be heated up to 250 to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. A weighted charge of mold, molding compounds is then placed while the mold is still open, then two halves of the mold are closed and pressure is applied to make, it, to make the part. For FRP, specifically for FRP fan industry, this method is suitable for mass production of smaller fan parts. Protrusion is a continuous process for manufacturing of products having constant cross-section, such as structural shapes, beams, channels, pipes, tubing, etc. Protrusion, uh, protrusion produces pro profiles with extremely high fiber loading, and that's why sometimes those can be used as reinforcement parts for fan housings, especially for larger size fans. Here is a few pictures for the products. Secondary bonding is a process to join two pieces together, usually by applying adhesive bonding and wrapping structural layers. Laminates are typically ground prior to secondary bonding operations. Depending on resin properties, sometimes Secondary bonding could be a concern and requires special care for surface prote uh, preparation. Two pictures here give a good example of when secondary bonding is needed and how it looks. Some more pictures to show how and where secondary bonding is applied for impellers. 
Uh, the photo on the left, the photo on the left, impeller blades are set up and strapped to a back plate. The one on the right, a steel hub plate is overlaid onto an impeller plate for corrosion protection. Now we'll get into more details specific to when and how FRP can be applied to industrial ventilation fans. Fan material selection is a large part of design consideration when selecting a fan material. Um, a material with the right corrosion resistance and temperature limit is required for success, successful fan operation. We limit FRP, we listed the FRP with some other common fan materials like aluminum, carbon steel, stainless steel, a few other metal materials, and thermoplastics. To decide the type of material for fan application, considerations should be taken for factors like temperature, humidity, airstream chemicals, potential explosiveness, air particles, etc. This is an overview. This is an overview chart showing where materials locate, comparing to each other related to corrosion resistance and temperature. For example, carbon steel is subject to oxidization and corrosion, not really good at corrosion resistance. Thermoplastics, on the other hand, is a cheaper material with a high corrosion resistance. However, most common Thermoplastic materials are not suitable for fan applications with a temperature higher than 150 degrees. Now it highlights where FRP stands in the chart. For abrasion resistance, most metal materials are, are better, while FRP and thermoplastics are not as good. Ceramic coating could be added to FRP top coat to improve abrasion resistance to a certain level, um, but for severe, severe air applications where high abrasion resistance is required, FRP would not be an ideal selection. Now it highlights where FRP stands comparing to the other listed materials. Spark resistance. It is another important design factor to consider. There are many applications having explosive airstream where requiring fan material with a high spark resistance. FRP have excellent electrical insulation properties to make it spark resistant. Here it highlights where FRP is. As FRP become recognized by engineering society and widely used in some industries, this material and its fabrication become regulated by many industry standards. Here we listed a few mostly commonly used standards like ASTM C582, it's for contact mold making. ASTM D4167 is specific to FRP fans and blowers fabrication including construction of fan housing, wheel, shaft holes, balancing, and fan test run. ASTM D2563 listed various acceptances with allowable defects for FRP fabrication. There are four levels listed in the specification where level one allows no visual defects of any size. Level two and level three regulates allowance to a certain degree and level four requesting defects to be specified based on the job on the drawing.
Another standard list here, ASTM E84. It is a standard test method for surface burning characteristics of building materials. It groups three classes based on flame spread rating. Some non-flame retardant resin may, may gain a little bit of flame retardancy by adding antimony, trioxide, or some other chemicals. FRP lamination is mainly composed of corrosion barrier and structural layers. Corrosion barrier can be selected um, a various, from a various type of material determined by application environment in airstream chemicals. Structural layers are usually decided by system requirements or design conditions. We'll talk a little bit more about them uh, into the details. Here we pulled up an example of a fan housing laminate cross-section. Um, outer corrosion barrier would design for protection against outside environment. On the other hand, the inner corrosion barrier would be designed specifically for protection against airstream chemicals. Structural layers are sandwiched in between. Typically, fan impeller outer corrosion barrier would actually have a similar layers as housing interior corrosion barrier because they both are in contact with airstream. So for the same consideration of airstream corrosion resistance, the layers are very similarly, similarly defined. We'll walk through main fabrication material components in the next few slides. As what FRP stands for, fiberglass reinforced plastics, two main components are self-expanding as fiberglass for, for reinforcement and resin as a thermal setting plastics. Um, then with top coat probably designed for protection. Sherry, our top coat typically has <clears throat> ultraviolet inhibitors, so the sun does not degrade the fiberglass. That is a really good point for, um, as a reason to select top coat method. We actually talk a little bit more about that as well to show in certain environment what, we, what would be a recommendation for a certain protection environment. There are many types of resin in the market. Reliable resin selection demands accurate and complete information about the, the application and use of proposing equipment. When the customer is depending on the fabricator to make a resin selection, detailed service information is needed. Most resin adds catalyst during fabrication. A proper catalyst system selection should be decided based on the selected resin and applications well. Corrosion barrier at surface veil sometimes could also be called as reinforcement. It is intended to provide limited reinforcement to thin resin-rich resin layers on the exposed surfaces of corrosion-resistant equipment to reduce cracking and crazing of the resin. Chemical service can definitely influence the selection of the surface veil material. The commonly used veil material is a fiber made from type C glass veil shown in the picture. It is widely used for fan applications where there isn't special chemicals that could attack glass fibers.
Synthetic veils, such as nexus, made from polyester or other man-made fibers, are used for environments that could actually affect, attack glass fibers over here. Top coating is another layer to protect exposed surfaces. The picture here shows a person hot coating a housing plate after encapsulating stainless steel hardware entrapped to the plate. Like mentioned earlier by Junior, for some outdoor applications, UV protection should be applied to top coat for exterior surfaces. Carbon gel coating uh, is often used when explosive airstream is ob observed. Sometimes it may also be replaced as a carbonated veil. Either way, it can prevent buildup of electric static and typically requires surface to be grounded. Sure, yeah, I was just going to comment that noted there that the carbon gel coat meets the, the highest level of spark resistance uh, as defined by him. Exactly. Specific to fan applications and many other airstream applications, Smoothing interior surfaces help with airflow. Delamination or heat stress could affect product quality or surface quality. Two photos here shows a comparison of different quality levels in regards to fabrication and surfaces. And you can see that it actually is pretty telling um, by comparing the two pictures side by side. For corrosive applications like where FRP fans would be selected, metal parts needed, are needed to be fully encapsulated to protect them from airstream. Hub encapsulation and extension out through fan housing would also protect shaft from con contacting airstream. Again, all as, you know, stainless steel hardware from housing installation should be strapped to the housing from the interior and then uh, needs to be fully encapsulated by FRP. <clears throat> Sherry, we also supply sometimes Hastaloy or titanium alloys uh, in place of the 316 stainless steel bolting in severe corrosive environments. Thank you, Junior. But the internally, those parts are still encapsulated. Yes, right? internally, they're still encapsulated in FRP. ASTM stand, industry standard ASTM D4167 listed a good range of allowable defects in the construction of FRP fan wheels, adapted from D2563. This one is only a sample page screenshot from the standard. Uh, I don't expect you to read it through from this fine letters. No, no actually we do. We're going to get a couple this. minutes to read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the quiz for you guys. No, just kidding. <laughs> so for anyone who is interested in the details listed over here, feel free to, you know, find a full copy of the standard and read it through. Jerry, in just general though, in addition to air bubbles, which you already mentioned, maybe you could just name a few of the other specific cracking, you know, crazy or junior. Cracking, what crazy. crazing. Uh, there's also uh, air pockets things of that nature that's also addressed in, in the specification. But a variety of, of visual uh, observable defects yes. that need to be 
minimized in any type of elimination. Right. Yeah, like burning, delamination too, uh, in addition to the cracking. Well, we have what we call jack strawing, which is the fiberglass strands are not properly wet out, and they they show up. It almost looks like a straw, if you will, in the laminates. There's an air pocket all the way along the length of the fiber. Well, it's actually the fiber itself hasn't wet out properly, so I, I'm, I don't know that it's exactly an air pocket, but the fiber itself had not absorbed right. the the resin, so therefore it's a dry surface. <clears throat> yeah, visual inspection is one of the major inspection methods for FRP fabrication. It is also why uh, sometimes hand layup is a better method for impeller fabrication because it allows laminator to perform visual inspections at the time of laminating so that he or she can roll out big air bubbles as, ob as observed. Photos here compare an enlarged view to the same scale for two FRP surfaces to show different quality of lamination. Sherry, in the plant, <coughs> Our laminators actually, when they're building a fan impeller, we build it out of a, a clear or natural laminate. There's no pigmentation, and the laminators actually use a fluorescent light that they can look through the glass and, and to see any imperfections in the lamination. And that's why you can see probably from the two pictures see the quality difference because the way that they do, you know, the, the good job into the lamination, the one on the left would show actually significant air bubbles trapped in the lamination, and the one on the right with proper lamination, it would only show minimum entrapped air visible. As a summary to specifying FRP material for fan applications, proper resin needs to be selected with appropriate catalyst promoter based on products and applications. Surface veil needs to be selected based on interior airstream or <laughs> exterior environment. Factors like adding UV inhibitor flame retardancy, spark resistance should be taken into consideration as well. Metal parts should not be directly exposed to the airstream. And also last but not least, visual inspections should be performed in accordance with industry standards. Now I will pass it along to John Tonkwood to introduce FRP fan industries and applications. Thanks, Sherry. Good afternoon, everyone. In the next few slides, we'll cover some specific industries and applications where FRP fans are a good choice for the intended surface. This is a list of primary industries where FRP fans are, are well suited for uh, for both the process and the and the ambient environments because uh, Sherry's been talking a lot about the the airstream itself, and that's obviously the most critical. But a lot of industries, uh, the ambient environment can be uh, somewhat uh, corrosive in nature, also. Chemical process industry, it's, that's a very broad category that has a wide range of applications that involve the production or use of various corrosive chemicals, inorganic and organic acids, halogens, oxidants, and many water reactive compounds. Fertilizer production, that can involve sulfuric acid, nitric acid, then there's byproducts such as phosphorus pentoxide, which is uh, uh, can react with water and form phosphoric acid, fluorides, and fluorosilicic acid, or a few others. Metal finishing involves various acids and alkalis for cleaning to scaling, plating. Chromic acid is a good example of that. In the mining area or processing utilizes a number of corrosive compounds such as sulfuric acid, nitric acid, and sodium cyanide. The pharmaceutical industry employs various halogens and inorganic acids used for their uh, formulations for medications. 
pulp and paper industry uses various sulfur compounds in the pulping process, and a number of chemical oxidants are also used in the bleaching processes. Semiconductor is one that uses a, a very large number of different compounds uh, in, in processing uh, inorganic acids, halogens, reactive halogen compounds, ammonia, and many others. Steel pickling, which is a, a process remove, uh, used to remove uh, surface impurities from steel. Um, there's a, a variety of concentrated inorganic acids that are used for those uh, processes. And they're at very elevated temperatures, typically. So hydro, all the inorganic acids, hydrochloric, sulfuric, nitric, hydrofluoric, they're all used uh, in varying amounts. And it, it depends on the type of, uh, of metal that's being pickled. In many cases, the more, uh, more exotic the alloy, the uh, more difficult the uh, corrosion environment. And the wastewater treatment industry, primary corrosion issue is exposure to high humidity ventilation air, which contains uh, hydrogen sulfide and, and various other reduced sulfur compounds, such as mercaptans and dimethyl sulfide. So this is a list of some of the more common chemicals, which are definitely good applications for using FRP equipment and specifically for FRP fans if the chemicals are expected to be present in the exhaust gas stream. Inorganic acids, again, used in almost every application across the board for so many industries. Halogens, chlorine and bromine. Halogen compounds such as boron trichloride, boron trifluoride, tungsten hexafluoride, titanium tetrachloride. Many of these compounds, when they come in, uh, into contact with humid air, they react to form acids. Uh, ECL3 decomposes to hydrochloric acid. EF3 forms fluoroboric acid, so they're all very aggressive. Sulfur compounds, sulfur dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, all the captains. Uh, and uh, dimethyl sulfides. Oxidants such as chlorine dioxide and sodium hypochlorite or bleach. Chlorosilane such as silica tetrachloride and trichlorosilane used extensively in the uh, solar industry. Inorganic salts, too numerous to name, there's just a few common examples there. And uh, organic acids, again, a few common examples, formic, acetic, and acrylic acid. They're used in a number of processes. So now we'll look at a few examples of applications where FRP fans are, are a pretty good selection for the particular process. This first example is a pill coating operation in the pharmaceutical industry. A, a good percentage of uh, prescription and non-prescription drugs are manufactured using hydrochloric acid because it helps form the hydrochloride salt of the specific medication, which is what makes it soluble and absorbable. In this case, both HCL and particulate from the drying operation were exhausted to an FRP scrubber that's using a sodium hydroxide scrubbing solution. So we have another poll question at this point. The uh, question is, should a corrosion-resistant fan be used downstream of a scrubber? I'll give you a few seconds to answer that question. And the majority of you have indicated, yes, it should be. Do you still think maybe not? And it's a reasonable question. Some people do ask, why do I need an FRP fan after a scrubber? Shouldn't the gas be clean? That's what the scrubber is supposed to do. Well, first, no scrubber is 100% efficient at removal of the contaminants. So there's always going to be some trace amount of the pollutants going through the scrubber and exiting downstream into the, the ductwork and fan located after the scrubber. 
Secondly, the air leaving the scrubber will be 100% saturated with water vapor. So if you do have any residual acids that are present, even at low concentration, they tend to be more aggressive in a humid environment. And then thirdly, every system has upset conditions, no matter what, or possible mechanical failures or improper maintenance, et cetera, et cetera, that will result in higher outlet loadings or even maybe liquid carryover from the scrubber. And that could also damage the downstream fan. The scrubber in the prior example utilized sodium hydroxide to neutralize the hydrochloric acid, so any potential liquid carryover could include both sodium hydroxide and the byproduct sodium chloride salt. Uh, if the scrubber's not operated properly, improper uh, um, makeup water, et cetera, to the system, the acids and, or the uh, salts and byproducts could get concentrated, so any carryover that, that gets downstream into the fan could also be uh, corrosive and damage the fan. So it is important to make sure when you're selecting fan material construction that all possible contaminant exposures are considered, not just the ones that are in the airstream initially. So the next example here is municipal wastewater treatment. This particular application is for ventilation fans from the headworks area of the, water, of the wastewater treatment plant. The headworks is the main receiving area for incoming wastewater and sludge, and uh, it typically has the highest concentration of sulfide gases in the treatment plant. It can be in the neighborhood of 100 to 200 parts per million. After the previous example, you'll notice in this case that the scrubber solution is not listed in this one. Uh, that's because in this particular system, the fans are located upstream of the scrubbers. So this is a forced draft design as opposed to an induced draft design with the fans downstream of the scrubbers. So in this case, the fans are not going to see any potential carryover from the scrubber. At the same time, though, they are going to see the highest level of corrosive contaminants because the sulfides have not been removed in the scrubber, you know, as they would be if the fan was located downstream. So they're going to see the high concentration and potentially the most corrosive environment. The third example is ventilation of a semiconductor fabrication facility. As I mentioned previously, the, uh, the semiconductor manufacturer utilizes a number of corrosive chemicals to manufacture integrated circuits or microchips, inorganic acids, uh, many uh, reactive halogen compounds are used for chemical vapor deposition in this process. And the relative concentrations of the contaminants are probably moderate compared to many other applications in the 25 to 150 ppm range but the list of, of potential corrosive chemicals is pretty extensive. And uh, that doesn't even include the, the interaction of those chemicals with the gas phase, which can occur in some instances. Steel pickling is a, is a very good application for FRP fans. Since the process uses inorganic acids, and it's probably one of the most aggressive applications with regards to corrosion, because they use very high concentrations and temperatures of 160 to 180 degrees in the, in the acid pickle tanks. The exhaust scrubbers, in many cases, use water only without any alkaline additives, because they want to try to recover the weak acid solution and return it back to the rinse tanks. So in, in this case especially, even if the scrubber that's being used on this application has high removal efficiency, um, for example, hydrochloric acid is extremely soluble in water. It only, ta it only takes a few ppm of, of HCl in the gas phase uh, to create a very acidic solution, pH less than 1, in any liquid that condenses downstream of the scrubber. And there will be condensation because of the high temperature coming off the process. So even if your scrubber is achieving single-digit part-per-million level concentrations at the outlet, your condensate downstream could be very acidic.
The last example is from a food additive production process. This one uses both chlorine gas and phosgene as feedstock chemicals. The scrubber system is designed in this case for both normal operation and emergency venting. Uh, the normal operation was reasonable temperature range. The emergency uh, condition resulted in, in higher, much higher temperature operation, and that's why for this case uh, a high temperature vinyl ester was used for the fan construction and for the scrubber and, and ductwork also. The scrubber is using sodium hydroxide solution to neutralize the contaminants, so that's going to produce the sodium chloride salt from uh, reaction with uh, the phosgene, but it's also going to produce sodium hypochlorite from, which is the bleach oxidant from reaction with the uh, chlorine. So the fan material construction was selected based on exposure to both the process gases and the byproducts of the, uh, op the scrubbing operation. So I'll turn this back over to Sherry now just to close the presentation. Yes, as uh, briefly introduced by John, um, the applications is re really important. So it's critical for proper selection of the FRP fans. Um, with that side said, with proper uh, selection of the fans, it can definitely provide superior corrosion resistance. Also, FRP fans have demonstrated a very long service life in extremely corrosive environment 24-7. Again, there are many examples showing historically uh, cases like the fans being in operation for 20, 30, even more than 40 years. FRP fans are lighter weight, especially for impeller rotating at a higher speed comparing to some of the metal material. Um, the lighter weight of the impeller would allow the use of smaller shafts and the bearing arrangements. FRP fans is highly reliable and economical, you know, comparing to a lot of the other steel and alloy, uh, alloy fans, especially for corrosive applications below 20, 250 degrees. Um, and that's it for our presentation today. Okay, we're going to open up the floor here to some questions, and then we will summarize at the end again for anyone who's here for the PDH portion. But let's do a couple questions here before we run out of time. What fabrication process does Barantis use? Yeah, we use the hand lay method in the chop spray for building our fans, the blowers. Uh, most of those pictures that you uh, saw, the actual live pictures, are actually from our production facility. Yeah, on the impellers, though, we do just hand lay. We do not use chop spray. The chop spray is just on the fan housings and guards. Let me clarify that. Okay. Uh, next question that we have, what is the recommended max continuing operating temperature? There are temperature rating uh, of, often called out as 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, most of the resin would be feasibly selected for 250 degree in regards to heat distortion temperature. However, specifically for impeller, typically we don't recommend application of temperature higher than 225. Just because when the impeller is running fast, um, also in service for a few, you know, a, a while, the mechanical attribute could be actually derated. Uh, de Okay, next question. Does Barantis manufacture fans for use in class one div one applications? Absolutely. Yeah, we talk about spark resistance for FRP um, material in general. We talk about carbon gel coating for electric uh, grounding. Um, that's all the, you know, suitable for the class one div one applications. 
We actually, as a matter of fact, we supply a lot of class one div two fans. And div one fans? Div one, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> When do you use CBAIL versus Nexus? CBAIL versus Nexus is typically, depending on the acids and the chemicals being used, uh, Nexus Veil is a polyester material, which is highly corrosive and resistant in itself. Uh, in conjunction with the resins, makes it very, very uh, chemical resistant. The CBAIL is not as chemical resistant as the nexus, so it's going to be determined determined by the chemicals in the process. Probably the most common application <clears throat> where nexus is definitely required is for fluorides and, and HF surface, because HF is very aggressive towards the glass. So it's very important that you have a layer of synthetic material that's uh, not going to be affected by the HF. Um, in front, uh, in the corrosion barrier and ahead of the structural glass layers. We have a multi-part question here. Are fans typically balanced as a result of FRP construction? How do you balance the fan wheel? And is the tip speed of uh, FRP fans similar to metal fans? Okay, I'll answer the first part of that. Uh, the fans are actually balanced three times in the facility where we build them. Uh, we do a static balance prior to the final coating uh, being applied. Once that's complete, it goes into a dynamic balance, or we do a two-plane dynamic balance, typically to G6.3 uh, in the balancer. And then after the fan is completely assembled, we run the fan up to operating speed or as close as possible for impeller only, and that's balanced to uh, 0 0.0785 inches per second. And we do not re typically remove FRP when we balance the fans. I mean, if, if you're talking 10, 15 grams, typically we'll add more material. Uh, just a, additional coating layers, but if it's a significant weight, we actually grind down through either the nexus or the C-Bale to the good structural layers, and we add a patch, if you will, of fiberglass and resin uh, and balance it that, that way. And that's structurally better for... It's structurally better. I know years ago, I'm talking 30 years ago, uh, we were using lead weights at one time, bolted in, and covered in fiberglass. Because of the higher tip speeds on some of the fans, it would sling the lead weights out. Then we went to steel weights probably 20 years ago, but then since then we have changed, and it's all fiberglass, the same material that the impeller is built from. Some other manufacturers also take weight off, though, without actually going back and resealing. Isn't yes, that correct? That's Which correct. actually ends up uh, destroying some of the um, corrosion resistance. Yes. So, okay. Sherry, you want to answer the tip speeds? Um, generally, the maximum allowable tip speed it would be depending on a lot of times the physical testing of the design impeller. So it can be very, you know, dependent on the the physical structure of the impellers. Um, with the experience that I've been you know, observed, uh, I do believe FRP impellers would have a, a little bit lower maximum tip speed comparing to the same of metal fans because of the physical limitations. Now, haven't we at, at times, though, if an application did require a higher tip speed, we would put a um, metal impeller, typically a, a exotic, alloy or titanium to that extent, correct? We've done that? Correct, because, you know, impeller is the most critical part. Well, the housing doesn't really require a lot of the um, mechanical requirements. So sometimes when the application requires a higher tip speed, we would use metal fans instead so that uh, a combination of the metal impeller and housing would be the most economical way. Yeah, so go. we would do a metal impeller with an FRP housing so you still have the... Uh, meets all the requirements of a high tip speed application. Exactly. Okay, we are out of time here, so I want to just um, 
anybody who has asked a question, don't worry. We will get back to you individually. But just want to, again, remind all those who are here for the PDH portion of it, remember the last two widgets are the most important ones. The uh, yellow widget, that's going to tell you basically if you've been here the whole time, you've fulfilled their time requirements, you just need to take the test, which is the last widget on the end, the green one, get 8 out of 10 correct, and you'll be able to come back to that yellow widget and uh, print out the um, actual certificate. If you came in late, don't worry, you can actually come back and view the on-demand uh, video recorded version, uh, fulfill your time requirements, take your uh, test, and then print out your certificate later as well. We are actually going to go quiet here audio-wise, but I am going to keep the actual presentation live until about 1.30. That will give you guys all time to finish the quiz, print out your uh, certificates, and also just print out any of the um, materials that you want from the resource list. So just want to thank everybody for uh, attending today. We appreciate you coming to us, and we hope that we will see you again in the future for some of our future webinars. Take care and have a great day.